Fans of the Horus Heresy, thank you very much for joining me for a model, build and tactics review of the Legio Custodes Orion-class assault dropship for the Talons of the Emperor by Forge World. To top out my long series of videos on model, build and construction of this very impressive resin model, in this video I'm going to show you around the model and give you some thoughts on what I think about it and some key call outs as well. I'm going to give you a summary of the build process and what I thought about that. I'm not going to go into great detail, so I've probably done around two or three hours content on this model separately, talking about the build because it's quite a complex thing and as you would expect from a £275 resin kit there's a lot to do there. So what I will do is just summarise the key points and observations around the whole build process and what I generally think about the kit. Then in terms of size comparison, we'll do a little bit of a size comparison against its comrades in the Legio Custodes Talons of the Emperor Force I've got. Instead of doing loads of individual size comparisons, because I haven't really got many models of this size, what I'll just do is I'll give you the dimensions. So we'll break out the tape measure. And then finally, we will move on and we'll have a review and the tactics of the rules for this model that have been published by Forge World. So that's what this video is going to be around. So let's start off with looking at the actual kit. And this is an absolutely stunning model. It's, it, it really is. I have to um, take my hat off to the guy who originally sculpted this. I can't remember his name. And then the guy who finished the sculpt, which was Darren Parwood, they have done a brilliant job with this dropship. This is by far and away, from my personal viewpoint, my favourite looking flyer ever done in Warhammer 40,000. And I'll talk a bit about that as we move through the review as to why I think that. There's lots of great fly kits in 40k and that Forge will make. Lots of great models, but this is my favourite. Just looking around it, we can see we've got a large sort of spacecraft vessel. It's clearly supposed to be a spacefaring vessel. And we've got a large central fuselage, a cargo bay, or a troop carrying bay, and these two large booms that house the engines and then the manoeuvring surfaces as well. Looking down on this model, we've got lots of fantastic details on the top. We've got a single-headed eagle here. We've got what has become the standard custodian cockpit design, and this is shared by all of the custodian vehicles we've had thus far. So that's a really nice continuation of a design theme, and also links nicely into the individualist fighting nature of the custodians. So as far as I can tell, every custodian vehicle so far is piloted by a single custodian. And I don't think this is any exception. Then we've got some nose mounted heavy weapons. These are Lastrum bolt cannons. We've got lots of detailing on the upper deck, including this, which is a shield projector of some sort. And this is what is called the Eclipse Shield. And we'll talk about that in the actual rules. It's got nice smooth lines, lots of curves to it, unlike normal 40k flies for the Imperium. That's why I like it. Yeah, it's still got a chunkiness to it that clearly lets you know it's human tech. What we'll do now is we'll take the model off the stand and then have a look around with the actual kit. This is a standard Games Workshop flight stand here, this large plastic one, and then it's mounted onto a 150 millimeter round base. I've done some work to strengthen that. Okay, so here we have the Orion up close. Now let's do some side view. So the first thing about this model is wonderfully detailed nose section. It's absolutely brilliant. I don't think I've ever seen a model which is so packed with sensors. Even the eyes of the Reva Titan, which are sensorlicious, I don't think rival this. And really, really nice. These Lastrum bolt cannons are on pivots and then the whole turret can rotate through 360 degrees as well. And I magnetize these with some N35 neodymium magnets. They come with pegs that push in, but I thought, well, on a model like this, why bother taking a half measure like that when it's so easy to actually make a proper job of it. And I used, I think those are three by four millimeter neodymium magnets. So now looking at the details on the upper surface, we've got lots of nice panel lining running over the model various places at various details, such as these sensors. There's a bit of a closer look on the upper deck of the vessel. We've got two small fins that run down the back of the body of a dropship. And then I do like these little designs here. These look like air scoops on either side of the fuselage. And perhaps those are, I don't know, who knows what they're for. Maybe they're to drive 
like an APU system or some sort of power generator. Got another set of air intakes here. And then if we look at the back of the model, we've got a whole bunch of sensor nodes as well on the rear of the model around the um, actual entry hatch. And if we lower the entry hatch as well, we can see that we've got a detailed ramp with the Imperial Thunderstrike badge on it. And then we have a fully detailed interior. Now it's, I'm not gonna be able to show you that very well. There you go, got a bit of light in there. But that's, this is a really cool feature of this model, fully detailed. We'll take the model apart in a little bit. We'll see that properly. One area of this model that's fantastically well detailed are the engines as well. And these are reminiscent of a lot of other Imperial engine types, and particularly the engines we've seen on custodian vehicles previously. We've got the lots of little bits of you know, engine piping. We've got these actuated thruster vanes. And a feature of this I particularly like are these spiked nozzles or spiked exhausts on the engines. I think the designer knows a bit about real world engines, and I think these look like they're supposed to be a type of aero spike jet or perhaps aerospike rocket. That's a really cool feature to see a real world piece of tech. Aerospike engines have been made. The largest versions that have been built have a very different appearance to this, but there are test versions that have been built like this with the actual pointed spike that work. So it's nice to see a bit of real world rocketry design being brought into this model. It's the far future. It's good to have ideas like that. And then the other thing I like are these compressor pipes here. What I imagine is bypass compressor pipes. And these make me think of the airflow system on the SR-71 Blackbird's engines. It's used a very clever air bypass compressor system to achieve its high-speed cruising capability at altitude. And again, I wonder if the designer had a bit of knowledge of these real-world aircraft engines that he brought into this. Beautifully detailed control surface. You've got an actuated flap. If you were very keen, you could probably cut this off and angle it. And then we've got these little winglets at the front, or perhaps I don't know if you'll call them canards, but probably winglets. They're very nice. And there's some more details on the side, some sort of cooling heat sinks, perhaps. These, I've not stuck these yet, just to show you. These are on a, uh, a circular hinge, so you can angle them how you want, which is a nice feature. And I suppose you could build it, leave them mobile. All right, now let's move on to the underside of the model. And much like the Legio Custode's Cronus Grav Tank we have down there, this is fully detailed from all directions of view. It's a very nice and detailed model. There's been no compromising on putting detail on any side of this model. Things have got, look a bit rougher and squarer. That fits with the general design. Now all this looks like the anti-gravity sort of, what you imagine to be the anti-gravity floating system of the previous custodian vehicles. So the Cronus, the Caladius and the Pallas. So yeah, good features there. They've got the underside of the engine nacelles or the engine booms. And now we can also see the main part of this flyer's impressive armament. The main guns, these enormous, formidable looking devices are Arachnus heavy blaze cannons. It mounts a pair of those. These aren't twin linked weapons, These are it's a pair. So straight away, this thing's got absolutely beastly main firepower. And then it has a pair of spiculous bolt launchers mounted in an underwing pod. And these borrow a little bit from the spiculous bolt launcher we saw on the Telebon Heavy Dreadnought previously. Nice details on the rear lower. I like this here. Perhaps these could be some bleed pipes, uh, fuel vents, or perhaps connectors for refueling or refluiding the dropship when landed. Beautifully detailed model. Lots of features you look at, and you can kind of imagine what they might do in the real world. One final detail call out before we have a look on the inside of this vehicle is here we have a set of air brakes now these are designed to actuate like so they're quite fragile and while they're supposed to hinge they are they don't properly latch in position and i spent quite a lot of time working on these to try and get them to latch now i don't know if that's because of the way mine's being cast but so at the moment i've left them loose i'm not sure quite what i'm going to do about those yet one thing you could do if you chose to put them in an open position like so you could just enhance the detail a bit and also the strength by putting a couple of metal pins in as actuating arms. One thing you might wonder though is the location of the air brakes are in a slightly aerodynamically odd position being behind this connecting wing. Perhaps they would have been better on the outside or on the upper surface or lower surface of the fuselage. Although aerodynamic oddity positioning aside, I do really like the design of these. And I think whoever did, made these has been watching videos 
of the recent SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket launchers and recoveries. These look a lot like the Falcon 9 air brakes that are on the rockets and it's got like a set of four that it uses to slow itself as it returns into the atmosphere to land to touch down either at sea or on dry land. Let's take a look at the Arachnus Heavy Blaze cannons in a bit more detail. Fantastically detailed, complicated multi-part weapons. Got all sorts of detailing here. Got some uh, heavy duty Imperial riveting on these. It has like this multiple barrel design. So it has like four barrels and that mirrors the kind of in-game way this weapon works. So they have a tour around the outside. One thing I'd just like to talk about is influences on this model. So I see a lot of science fiction influences on this model and real day influences. First and foremost, and the reason why I love this model from the moment I saw it, was it reminds me of the tug from the spacecraft Nostromo, or the actual main part of the Nostromo space vessel itself from the film Alien. And you've got a large chunky main body and a pair of booms. And it's laid out a bit differently, but there's, for me, there's a really strong design parallel with it as well. And particularly on this underside detailing as well, that really puts me in mind of that classic science fiction spacecraft. It also makes me think of the US Marine Corps' current high-speed transport, the Osprey. The form matches the function. And you've got a large troop bay, and then you've got booms. Now on the Osprey, the booms rotate, and they've got large props. For me, there's a, a real parallel there between the two. Lots of you guys and girls have called out other inspirations you thought for this spacecraft, and there's lots of good ones in there. Another one that i just like to give a little honourable mention here is someone said it looked like the Kestrel spacecraft from the game FTL. And yes, I certainly see that as well, particularly if you shrunk these nacelles down and brought them closer into the body. It bears a lot of resemblance to the FTL Kestrel. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to open the body up and then we'll have a look at the interior detail. Start by looking at the lower section first. So this is the interior detail on the lower tray of the Orion dropship. I think on this model, the interior detailing is well justified and very nicely received. On the Cronus Grav Carrier, I thought it was unnecessary. It created complications in the kit design. Here, on a flagship model, such as this Lord of War, I think it's really well done. There's two ways you could build this model. You could do it closed or open. I've chosen to do it where I can paint the interior detail. So let's have a quick look at this. We've got this large oval design device with an Imperial single-headed eagle and a Thunderstrike symbol, another Thunderstrike symbol. And then we have eight seats located in two rows of four split between two levels of a dropship bay connected by a set of stairs and then this links through to the flight deck. Lots of controls, we've got a control pad here, controls here for the door. These four occupants have got a data pad beside them with a set of controls. Um, the seats look a good size, they look the right sort of size for a custodian. Some nice little call out details here. These arched vents, these feel consistent with the venting on the rear of various custodian units on their power packs, really like that, yeah. And then we've even got riveting here around the door seal. Really, really nice interior detail. And yeah, in my opinion, worth the effort, or worth considering the effort to enjoy that detailing. And now let's have a look on the upper side, on the underside of the upper side, how about that? So following on from the underside, we've got headrest for the eight seats, lots of pipe work and other gubbins running around the interior of the spacecraft. And then on the ceiling, we've got what appear to be a series of light emitters for illuminating the interior of the spacecraft. Another control pad, another control pad here. So beautifully detailed interior, not over the top. It has a suitable amount of ornate detailing with this being custodians. However, it's not over the top, I don't believe either. So that's the interior detail. Let's bob this back together and then we're going to go to a new camera angle. I'll talk about the build before moving on to the rules. Okay, so we're now down on the deck a bit with the dropship and the sharp eyed amongst you will notice that it's now mounted at a different height. Right, let me show you what's going on here. As well as the tall plastic stand, this guy here, get this girl here, which is a resin mounting post and it's set at a hovering height. Now you only get one base with the kit, but it's well worth acquiring a second 150 millimeter base so you can use both. Well, it certainly was in my mind and I can now put my model as either flying or hovering. Also a bit of advice I would normally store this model on the plastic base or display it on the plastic base 
and not leave it mounted on this because this is a resin part and it may well deform over time with the considerable weight of a dropship which weighs well over a kilo resting on that so just a little thought there so when mounted on that stand we drop the rear ramp open and it's now perfectly positioned as if it is deploying its troops that's really nice do like that a lot and another reason why for me the interior detail is worth considering spending the time and effort on with this particular kit let me move on and talk about the actual build of the Orion dropship. In terms of the build, I really enjoyed building this. I had an absolute fantastic time putting this kit together. It's a challenging build, certainly from a point of view of getting a very good fit and finish and cleaning off some of the mold seams, which are located in quite difficult places in some instances. But in my mind, it was well worth the effort. And the end result is absolutely spectacular from my point of view. Particularly if you want to make a good job of the interior detail, this isn't a kit for the faint hearted. It is a difficult build. Kind of in two bits. The bit that makes it difficult for me is getting the good fit and finish on the interior of the troop bay. The actual assembly of the main model was pretty straightforward and those of you who have seen it, I actually did that as a time-lapse build where I finished building this kit. It took me, I don't know, maybe four or five hours to do that. Yeah, it wasn't too bad. There was a lot of cleanup that went before that, bear in mind. The actual final assembly is not too difficult, but the interior detailing, it does pose some challenges. Now, the reason for that is the the hull you've got one large upper hull part and one large lower hull part and these are really hefty pieces and as you might expect on casting such a large piece of resin there is warping i don't think i would criticize forge world for getting some for producing this with a bit of warping on the under and lower side because it is such a large piece it's very difficult to cast it in a perfect attitude particularly when you're using silicon molds however the key thing for me was it all fit together properly in the end I'm not going to talk about the detail of how I did that because I've posted a whole series of videos and I'll leave links to those in the description of this video. I spent quite a lot of time working out the warps on the hull to get everything lined up properly and in particular get everything lined up snug and no gaps on the interior. So that's the takeaway from the build. If you're not so worried about actually doing the interior build side of things, then this becomes a much more straightforward kit to assemble. And you can actually recoup some of your cost from buying it by leaving out, there's, uh, I don't know, let me think, there's probably four, five interior detailing pieces that you could leave out of the interior if you're just gonna glue the door shut. Sell them onto your friends or put them on the fantastic eBay. Get some cash back on the cost of the kit. That's worth considering as well. Another mentions on the kit, so in terms of magnetization, well, as I've already talked about, I magnetized the chin guns or the nose mounted guns. I also put magnets into the door latch on the troop bay. Other things to bear in mind, these aero spikes on the engines are very sharp. Be careful not to cut yourself or just be aware of those, but more than you because you'll repair. Just um, be careful not to damage them because if you knock the end off one of those, it's going to be very tricky to rebuild it. Other thoughts about assembly, I mentioned the multi-positional control fins. Another thing to bear in mind is if you watch my videos, don't literally follow the instruction sequence that Forge will provide. Forge will guide tells you exactly how to put it together. However, I wouldn't advise you build it in the sequence that the instruction pamphlet shows. If you go and watch my build videos, you'll be able to see the order in which I actually did this construction work. The reason I didn't build it in the order they said was around getting the good fit on the interior. Other bits that are tricky to do, not too many really. This nose, this is quite a complicated shape, the nose piece, it's sort of like a, uh, it's like a crown, or it's like a got four prongs on it. I said it's like the root of a human tooth, like a molar with four roots. I had to spend a bit of time working inconsistencies of shape out to get a really good fit on the nose. We'll just look at that one more time. Move the guns out of the way. Yeah, it was a really good fit I got in the end. Everything lined up really nicely. And I was dead pleased with it. Something that may require a bit of work on the heat bending front. Another thing that took a, a bit of careful work was removing the mold seams on the sides of the fuselage. And in particular around this area here, there is a mold seam that ran along here on both sides. And I think there was a smaller one up here. Now I spent, I'd spend a lot of time carefully working that down with a combination of files, particularly sanding sticks and then fine sandpaper. So that's something if you want to get a really good fit and finish on this model that's well worth considering putting the time and effort into. I epoxy and pinned these wing joints here. 
super glued those they were, they were very snug fit these have got a bit of play in them to allow you to reposition and get a good fit and lined up on the wings but because of that i pinned epoxy those in position to give a really strong fit but i think that was the only bit of exceptional gluing i did when i glue the upper and lower fuselage together i'll just super glue it because it's such a complicated shape there's loads of contact points it's not going to need any stronger glue okay quick size comparison our friend ixi inhale and this is certainly the sort of transport you would imagine as being his vehicle of choice. And you can see it's an enormous beastie. And let's just do that coming down the ramp bit. There you go. That's an idea of a size. X inhales a really big miniature. This is a huge dropship. For the price, I actually feel you, you get a lot of bang for your buck, it feels to me. Okay, so got a big old tape measure here. Let's start off with the length. And that is about 29 centimetres. Probably call it 31. End of the aero spike to tip of the nose. So 31 centimetres that way. 28 centimetres across the wings. On the hover base, it stands at, well, let's do it to the top of this fin. That's 14 centimetres. And then corner to corner. So we'll say engine to the corner of the nacelle is about 35 centimetres. If you mount it on this stand, it's going to be probably an extra... 11 centimeters taller than it already is it's a big model it's almost square in plan form which is interesting when you consider the rules and the rules is what we're going to talk about now so my rule source for this review are these rules that have been published on the forge world website as you can see these are not marked as experimental so as i see it these are the final official rules for the legio custodes orion assault dropship i'll leave a link to those in the description and if you like to read the bump it's there we've already had the bump let's have a run through of the stats it costs 605 points and it is a lord of war choice for the talons of the emperor legio custodes army list found in the horus heresy book 7 inferno so one observation straight away is you can carry sisters of silence in this it's not restricted to transporting custodians only excellent 24 sisters of silence bursting out of this there's a thought the stats are as follows Ballistic skill 5, the front armour is 13, side armour 12, rear 11, hull points is 7. Clearly these are 7th edition rules, these are not 8th edition. The unit type is a super heavy flyer with hover and transport rules. Its war gear is 2 Arachnus pattern heavy blaze cannon, 2 nose mounted twin linked lastrum bolt cannons, 2 spiculus heavy bolt launchers, extra armour, armoured ceramite, the eclipse shield, macro array shrike, and an armoured cockpit. And the special rules are assault vehicle, grav backwash, and deep strike. And in terms of access points, we're talking about the rear only. And for transport capacity, now this is very interesting, it can carry 24 models. So that will be 12 custodians or 24 infantry. And one of those can be a single custodian Contemptor Achilles or Contemptor Galatus Dreadnought, which counts as 10 models per dreadnought so that's really cool that i was having a bit of fun with macca at the outer circle a few weeks back speculating on the transport capacities for this thing i said it will probably have a pallet mounted contempt to dreadnought that the custodians could kick out the back when they landed and yes yeah, sure enough you can if you take the dreadnought that leaves 14 spaces which means you can have six say terminators and a character like hail yeah i think they've designed this very nicely aligned to how the models are actually provided i.e sold so yeah thumbs up to forge all for that thank you okay let's go through the special rules so the macro array shrike i'm not going to go through all the detailing there though i'm sure magos will like the fluffiness of it it has three rules it has deep strike interference and targeting interference and those are as previously published in Horus Heresy Book 7 Inferno. So that basically messes with your opponent's deep strike rules very effectively. And then it also has what's called interception interference. And this is a real game changer, I think. When this model enters a battlefield, i.e. deep strike or from reserve, any enemy units which use the interceptor rule to fire on it have to roll a d6. If they roll a three or less, they can't make their interceptor attack, i.e. their sensors have been scrambled by the macro array strike. Excellent stuff. So this means you can fly this thing off and only 50% of enemy interceptor units will be able to shoot at it. If you fly it on and position it carefully and get the front arc towards the enemy, which is very easy with the square plan form of this model and its enormous size, you are really, really going to dilute down their firepower. Unless you've got things like deradios with the heavy last cannon battery, you're going to struggle to damage this thing at armor 13 plus the eclipse shield and we'll come on to that. However, if you do fall victim to the interception interference of a macro array strike, 
you can still fire as normal in the next shooting phase. Moving on to the Eclipse Shield, very nice fluffy. It's, it's kind of like a, well, it's, it's a combination of a flare shield and a stealth shield. And from a rules point of view, what this means is, well, it works just like a flare shield. Any shooting attacks, direct fire, suffer a minus one strength to the front arc. Any template or blast weapons lose two points of strength. I know from experience that units like this guy, equipped with a flare shield and also extensive playing that I've done with the Dracosan transport, flare shield, armor 13 plus a flare shield, and a host of other Mechanicum units. It makes the vehicle very tough. It is in effect like a Land Raider armor and it's even better versus blast weapons. However, the Eclipse shield does a bit more and this is this is like a force multiplier effect if you get damaged. If you suffer a glancing or a penetrating hit from an attack, on the front arc, the Orion then becomes shrouded or any further attacks in the front arc in that phase. Work that out, that may, <laughs> if you take any damage, it then becomes harder to hit, brilliant. It doesn't affect destroyer attacks or close combat attacks, even surprisingly, consistent with what we've had on flesh healing previously. So yeah, very solid. So you've got a flyer, you've got front armor 13, you've got the eclipse shield and you've got seven hull points. This is a tough cookie. One thing it does like though, is any auto repair function. Quite a few other units that have auto repair or or units in their forces like tech marines that can repair stuff. That is a consistent feature across the custodian force. There seems to be no feel, no pain and no auto repair systems. And that I think is sort of like their weakness. They're extremely tough units, but they can't fix because they're so sophisticated, both biologically and technologically, they can't repair over short time frames. Whereas low tech units, while they're less potent in combat, it is possible to have auto repair systems. I like that. Grav backwash is the same as what we've seen previously. Any models attacking in the fight subphase suffer a minus two to hit modifier. And the final new thing on this is a Spiculus Heavy Bolt Launcher. This is exactly the same as what was mounted on the Telemon Heavy Dreadnought. However, its fire rate has been reduced to Heavy 3 as opposed to Heavy 5, and it has no double up option. But in effect, you've got a pair, so you've got a Heavy 6 volley from those. So those are your rules. Right, tactical analysis. So this is an extremely potent combat unit and a decent sized transport. So. In the world of custodians, it can carry 12 custodians, which is a lot of points, particularly when you're looking at the Terminator variants and things like the Hecaton Guard, very dangerous. And throw in the heroes, like that chap or Constantin Valdor, and it just gets even more amusing. Very consistent, I suppose, with the custodians, smaller size but potent force capabilities. The ability to carry a Dreadnought is very powerful as well, I think. For me, the kind of like the ultimate mix is a Dreadnought, six custodians of your own choice, and they're all good in somewhere or another. You know, if you want the real maximum points, you put your guard in or your Terminators, one that some of the Aquila on, and a hero as well. Very, very powerful delivery system. That coupled with the deep strike, the macro array strike capability means that this thing isn't going to fail in its primary mission of delivering troops to the target. However, I would say arguably its combat capabilities exceed its troop transport capabilities. I would say on the Thunderhawk, it's kind of like balanced or maybe a bit skewed towards a transport capability. And on the Sokar, it's definitely skewed towards a transport capability. Here, the combat capability is more potent. And this thing has a weapon for every occasion. It really does. The Arachnus Heavy Blaze Cannons, You've got a 72 inch range, strength 10, AP 1, heavy 1 exo shock weapon. You've got a pair of these, very potent anti-vehicle, anti-tighting firepower even. Or you can fire in your alternate mode, have eight shots at strength 8, AP 3. Brilliant for mowing down heavy infantry, mulching light vehicles. Then you've got very potent anti-infantry firepower and anti-monstrous creature firepower in the form of the twin-linked Lastrum bolt cannons. So there's another six shots of death for you. you know, and remember heliothermic detonation, brilliant against monstrous creatures. And then finally, you've got the spiculous bolt launchers, which are great against light vehicles, good against heavy infantry because of their rending rule, and any of those sort of probably flyers as well. Now, another way to look at this is this is very potently farmed to fight anything protected by void shields. And what you basically do is you've got your Lastrum bolt cannons and your Spiculus bolt launchers. You can use those to flatten void shields and then go in with your Arachnus heavy blaze cannon on a concentrator blast for the killer blow. Very, very potent. And it's very potent attacking things head on and its maneuverability means that you can easily get flanking shots. In some ways, as a flanking shooter with these things firing on their burst fire with four shots at strength eight AP3, 
is absolutely deadly. Very versatile firepower. The only thing it doesn't carry is a blast weapon, but I don't really think that matters too much given the volume of shots it's got. I'm say you could have eight, 14, 20 shots in total at strength six or higher. Strength six, seven and eight, very good firepower. Yeah, I don't think it, I don't think it's wanting for lacking a burst weapon. As I've said before, we once again have a superlative unit for the Legio Custodes. And if you're looking at this thing from a point of view of pounds per point, it's an excellent buy at 275 quid. Did I actually just say that? I think that's everything I've got to say on the Legio Custodes Orion Assault Dropship, an absolutely brilliant model. Forget about the rules, it's a fantastic model, it's a beautiful model. It's up there now with my favourite models I've ever built. So it's, it's up there with my beloved Glaive Super Heavy Tank. It really is great. It's not necessarily the easiest build, you're going to have to do some work taking warps out to get a really good fit and finish, but I think the time put in is well worth it, certainly from the perspective of this example of the kit I bought. And if you have any problems with this, I mean it's a flagship model for Forge World, Get in touch with them. I'm sure they'll help you out with any dodgy parts you've got. Yeah, so there you go. The Legio Custodes Orion Assault Dropship. Fantastic model. Absolutely love it. Let me know what you think about this golden floater, the golden penetrator. That's what I'm going to call the Emperor's personal version of this, the golden penetrator. Please do share your thoughts on this model. It's rules in the comments as always. Do you think it's overpowered? Do you think it's underpowered? Do you think it's just right? Is it a Goldilocks zone unit? Could well be, you know, golden floater, Goldilocks zone. But as always, I'll be very interested to hear. But other than that, I'd just like to say thank you very much for watching. I'll speak to you next time, and goodbye.